Hi guys, welcome to the Trial Site News Podcast. I'm Dr. Aaron, your host. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We have a really interesting guest, Dr. Janie Shelton. She's with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And we are going to talk about some, re some research that she and her team did um, related to COVID-19. And so I guess starting there, um, Dr. Shelton, do you mind just telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah. Um, so my name is Janie. I am an epidemiologist at 23andMe. So I've been working on the research team and with our therapeutics group for um, about you know five five years now. And <clears throat> the database, uh, you know, at 23andMe has grown you know, to over you know, 10 million research participants who are genotyped. And so the primary um, focus of my work is designing studies and um, running analyses that try to make genetic discoveries uh, around certain health conditions or traits of interest. So I read your study published in Nature Genetics titled Trans Ancestry Analysis Reveals Genetic and Non-Genetic Associations with COVID-19 Susceptibility and Severity. So can you first just tell us a little bit about how you conducted that study? Yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, in, in January and February of last year, we um, became really interested in this question of why there was so much variability in the outcomes of people infected with SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, other infections have shown uh, associations with host genetics around susceptibility or severity. So we knew that uh, genetics might help us understand why some young people were getting terribly ill um, when it seemed like age was the main risk factor and all of that. And so, so we wanted to see, that was our primary aim. So what are the host genetic associations with severity of disease? Uh, but at that point in the outbreak, COVID was ex exceedingly rare in the United States. And so in designing our study, we had to be really careful uh, about trying to figure out how we could detect any cases in our database. So, you know, given we have millions of people to reach out to across the United States, we uh, came up with an approach to emailing the database to try to sort of track the outbreak as it uh, un unfolded around the United States. And so, uh, the way that we did that was using uh, projection models that were put out by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. So what they were doing is predicting hospital bed utilization at the state level. So we sort of followed those projections and, you know, and, and emailed our database around the country sort of after the peak uh, infections in the, in the first wave of the, of the outbreak in the United States. So, um, so that's how we reached out to the database. And um, it, it, was, it was surprising to us that we got you know, as many people as we did who had experienced COVID. Uh, we had to email you know, over 6 million people to, um, to, to get enough. Uh, data to, to look at um, in terms of genetic analyses, because you really need huge sample sizes to be able to detect associations. But, um, but yeah, so that was the first wave of our study. And then we opened up our study to people who had been hospitalized for COVID. So we gave uh, genotyping kits at no cost to people that had been hospitalized for um, infection with SARS-CoV-2 so that we could understand the, the very severe end of the spectrum as well. Very interesting. So you guys discovered some genetic and non-genetic associations uh, with people who tested positive for COVID, um, had symptoms, and also hospitalizations, which relates to severity, really. So can you first talk a little bit about some of the genetic associations that you guys discovered? Sure. So one of the first things that we found was comparing people who had been tested and they tested positive to people who'd been tested and they tested negative. So this is taking a population of people that were all tested during some bout of illness. Um, and within that group, we immediately saw a pretty strong association at the locus that uh, controls what your blood group is. So the first association to sort of come out of our data was the ABO locus in the genome, which governs whether or not you have O, A, or B, or AB blood groups. Um, 
So that was one of the first things that we dug into. So now that was that was uh, related to susceptibility to infection. So whether or not you tested positive. And what we found there was that people with type O blood were less likely to test positive for COVID-19 than, than people with the other blood groups. Um, we didn't detect any differences by rhesus factor, which is whether you're positive or negative. Um, and it looked like A and B and AB were all kind of similar risk, but O was the one that was uh, a little bit protective against infection. Um, and you found something out about chromosome 3P21.31. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So on the uh, on the severity of, of infection front, the chromosome 3 locus was really confounding in the beginning because it tags a bunch of different genes that are all plausibly related to, to severe infection. So when we first saw the association, I don't know how familiar your, uh, your listeners are with, with genome-wide association studies, but to, to just briefly describe what I'm, what I'm talking about, we run this analysis where we try to look at any region in the genome that might be different between people with severe and less severe infection. So one of the parts of the genome that popped up was this region on chromosome three. And now that particular region is related to at least three genes that are all sort of mechanistically possible possibly to be related um, to, to severity of infection. So they have some role in immune response or um, the way that proteins are expressed in cilia or something like that. And so it wasn't completely clear um, in the beginning what gene was actually involved there. One of the genes actually functionally interacts with the ACE2 receptor, which we know is what the virus actually binds to. Um, and that one has been identified through more functional work where folks have been looking at like, you know, CRISPR experiments and whatnot to try to, to, try to find map that particular region and see what gene um, is, is responsible for that association. So there's also some other chemokine receptors in there um, involved in, in a gene called CCR9, which has also been implicated. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's the chromosome three effect. Uh, and it does confer you know, a, a relatively large increased risk of, of severity um, among people with those variant types. Uh, but still, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the, the main determinant, right? It's, it's right up there with other uh, comorbidities and whatnot that are already known. Um, I had, a, I have another podcast called causes or cures. And I had a, I think I want to say hematologist, forgive me if I got his specialty wrong. When I go back and check, it might be wrong, but he came on and he talked about, um, this association with type O blood too, and, you know, being somewhat preventive. Um, and I know I'm typo, so I was like excited to hear that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, are there any reasons or theories as to why, one blood blood type might be more protective than another. There's a couple. So so blood group is actually something that's related to a whole host of of outcomes. So your blood group is actually associated with your risk of blood clotting and heart disease and certain uh, allergies. There's all kinds of things going on that are associated with blood group. So now when we think about um, the case of infection with SARS-CoV-2, there's a hypothesis out there that the anti-A antibodies that are, that are present for people with blood group O, people with blood group O have these antibodies uh, to anti, called anti-A and anti-B. So there's been some experimental work that has shown that anti-A antibodies actually functionally sort of interact with the, um, with the ACE2 receptor and, and, and have some like sort of dose response relationship with, uh, with COVID um, antibodies in the blood. So there's been some, some work sort of trying to understand that relationship. And so, um, so that would be, I think, my leading hypothesis. This isn't a, an area of specialty for me, but, um, but there's a couple other things that might be playing a part, but that, that was one thing that I thought was really interesting is that we saw sort of a dose response between the level of anti-antibodies that you have and the amount of, of COVID antibodies that you produce. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so you talked about the genetic associations. What were some of the non-genetic associations that stood out? Yeah, so we've done we've done work on this that we published in the paper. We've also done some work um, for our uh, risk model that's available on our website. So we have sort of a hospitalization uh, or COVID nineteen severity calculator on our website. So 
in our paper, we published that, um, that body mass index was associated with an elevated risk. We also saw type two diabetes uh, associated with elevated risk. Age, of course, is, is the, you know, probably the largest risk factor uh, for hospitalization. We also see in our data that African-Americans are about 80% more likely to be hospitalized with uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that's after adjusting for socioeconomic status using multiple variables. It's after adjusting for comorbid conditions. It's after adjusting for body mass. It's um, it's present, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't explain, you know, through any of our associations why there was a higher risk for African Americans in our data. Um, so that those are some of the main things that we found in our risk modeling. And now the interesting thing um, about how that relates back to the blood group um, issue is that type O blood is actually more common in African-Americans than it is in Europeans. And so you would expect to see actually that African-Americans would have a slight degree of protection against COVID-19. Um, so even given all of that, we still saw an elevated risk of severe disease in that population. Um, and I was going to ask you, I, you brought up the uh, differences in race. Was there anything else that stood out in terms of differences in race groups? So when we ran the genetic analysis, so, so genetic analyses have to be run within ancestral groups. And so we run them within Europeans, we run them within African-Americans, and then we can compare the effects uh, in different populations to see if the, if the identified locus actually behaves differently in different populations. And we didn't see any evidence of that. So basically these genetic risk factors function similarly across, across all race ethnic groups that we could identify in large enough sample sizes to run genetic analyses. Genetics, just fascinating stuff. I mean, you, work, you, <laughs> you do it every day. I'm just like, wow, that's really neat. Um, I guess my final question, um, are you guys doing any more research related to COVID? And you mentioned that there was a website and maybe people could you know, learn more, see some kind of modeling. Um, if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So uh, to, to look at our COVID severity calculator, you just go directly to our to our pub site, 23andMe.com, and you can find it there. Um, the, in terms of the, the research that we're doing moving forward, we've just uh, published some interesting results uh, on our blog about why some people feel more sick after getting vaccinated. Uh, and we found that people who had a prior history of COVID-19 were actually so twice as likely to feel like really sick after they got the vaccine. So that's not just anecdotal. We did see that in our data. We also saw some pretty strong um, age, age relationships and sex relationships. So younger folks are more likely to feel sick than older folks after getting the vaccine and whatnot. Um, and then we also just launched our long COVID study. So we've just emailed our, our database uh, of people who've, who experienced COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we've been asking questions about any persistent symptoms that they've experienced, because we would like to understand a little bit more about if there is any kind of genetic susceptibility to long COVID that can help explain or identify possible treatment avenues uh, or anything that we can help to, to sort of elucidate that phenomenon as we've all been learning, you know, affects um, a, a large number of people. So that's, that's our big study that we've just recently launched in the past two weeks. So that's fascinating. I didn't even know you guys did all this research. It's so fascinating. I just knew everybody would send in, you know, their samples and <laughs> try to figure out where they came from, but that's really cool. And it's really interesting. I'm going to go read uh, your blog now about the, you know, the people who were vaccinated um, have this, um, a, a bigger response, a worse response, suppose, I, I don't know if that's the appropriate word, but to the vaccine, because I know there's all this debate going on about, you know, natural immunity versus vaccine induced immunity and when you should get the shot when you shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you should just go with the natural immunity for a while. So that's really interesting to me. Um, so yeah. very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Dr. Shelton, thank you so much for your time. It was really fascinating. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, I look forward to our viewers, uh, check out 23andMe.com and I will post the links in the blog description as well. And um, thank you for being here, listening, comment, subscribe, share, all that, um, and have a good day. <laughs>